Happiness is the pursuit of a worthy goal. And that's kind of why we're here today is to help you pursue your timber frame goals. And I'm sure that as you move forward, you want to build strong, build smart, and avoid waste. So weak sauce timbers and building a 98 pound weakling is a little bit of a hidden weakness, a little bit like Achilles heel, which we'll talk about tension loading in this, and maybe even like Samson in the Old Testament. Very strong dude, but he had a weakness. If his hair was cut, he was weak sauce. So that's what we're going to be talking about today and helping you move forward, pursuing your goals. I'm Bert Sarkinen, the owner of Arrow Timber Framing. Been doing this a while. It's just been kind of a natural passion, just kind of sucked me in. And I'm glad to have you all here today. So leave comments, uh, share this with your friends, like it, all of the above. And the reason to do this for your interest is as you comment, as you ask questions, as you think about this, as you interact, the action is going to cement this information that you're going to get. It's going to cement it into your brain. And when you need it, when you're evaluating, evaluating which way you might want to build, you will have that information at your disposal or just bubble up like a spring. So comment, do all that. Scratch my back, you're scratching yours. So, okay. So let's see. Are we ready to get started, Lucas? Jump into the meat of it. All right. Weak sauce, 98 pound weakling. 
It happens easier than you think. We will be talking about the following here. So the big kahuna here is going to be tension loads and lateral bracing. And let's see, can we get this here? Okay, so then the overloaded beams and poor timber quality, that is something that is very visible and it's not so hidden. So it's not so much of a concern. And one thing, uh, one other thing that we will share with you is the way lumber is graded within the timber industry and the way engineers address that kind of negates a big concern here. It never keeps me up at night because of the safety built into it. Okay, so we're going to really focus on tension loads and lateral bracing and give you good concepts so that when you're making your decisions, when you're figuring out what you want to do, you've got good, just a instinctive stability. You won't have to remember the details of this because the principles will hopefully just kind of suck in and be there ready to help you out. Okay, tension loads. Truss applications, which is not lateral bracing, but facing resisting gravity, so big spans, so you don't have to use gargantuan beams, and that really gets into tension loading. And the knee braces, this is really about holding structures up, keeping them from falling down, and it uses tension loading and compression loading. And then, of course, when we're talking about tension loading, perpendicular to grain is typically where wood will have its weak point, where it'll blow out and fail. So we're going to kind of talk about that as well. And it'll be a little bit mixed up, but we're going to keep pulling it back to tension loads and just keeping things strong, upright, and from failing. So this will probably be a little bit of, you know, a lot of you may be aware of this, a simple truss, just kind of the concept of a simple truss. You see the red arrows here. The red arrows are compression, and we've got our loads coming down on the on the truss. And um, the blue arrows, that's compression. So this could actually be a cable, just as long as we get a good connection here and there. This can't fall over. So one thought exercise you can use for yourself, if you were to picture yourself with a coworker or whoever, and put your elbows on a table with a real steep angle. So this would be like a European church or that kind of a pitch roof, and have somebody apply pressure on the top of your fist and keep going until you start to feel your elbows slide. Okay, and then that would be the thrust, or how much pressure you need to withstand. And then if you go to say like a Mediterranean low pitch roof, like a 312, 412, and something down here, and, and apply force on your fist again, it'll pancake really fast because there's not, the, the thrust just magnifies them the lower that gets. And so that's what these connections are all about, that tension. The very most important Connection in a truss happens right here. In my early days of framing, residential framing, just the conventional building, simply, I remember whacking some, like sometimes trimming part of a truss and cutting some of this gang plate, kind of a bad move. At the time, it made sense to me because it was going to make it easier to put a valley rafter in and so it's kind of a little bit of a cringeworthy moment for me. The, the saving grace in my own head, why I don't lose sleep on it, is if we think about if we think about a big roof, say right here the valley and the truss that got cut a little black. So this truss right here is is weak sauce. But next to it is a 
strong truss and a strong truss, and then there's sheathing that runs through with a bunch of nails in it. So with the sheathing in there, that truss really can't blow apart. It picks up the neighboring trusses that here, let me lend you a hand, let me lend you a hand. And I don't think this truss is gonna go anywhere. And then there's also the safety factor that is applied to all engineering. And so there's all that involved too. If you've ever been in remod involved in remodeling and, and see what kind of thing cold up structurally is just amazing. It's not a place we want to go willingly, but we do have a safety buffer in there and a fairly large one. So that's kind of just a safety net for us. Okay, so here's a real life example of that simple European style truss that we were just talking about. And you can see here the pegs, the pegs happen right here. You can see they're kind of in the center of the truss. So this tenon goes all the way through. And the pegs are in the center, which is going to be your strongest point in placing a peg. And that is, of course, this could be a cable, like you said. We're looking at how well can we connect this piece to that piece. And as long as they can't come apart, you know, we're golden for strength. So perpendicular grain, if these pegs were not in the center, that means we reduce our strength. Because if the pegs were right, the pegs were right kind of by the edge, like a lot of, like in a lot of the, where the timbers are, it means that the wood can crack here and here if enough tension is applied. Okay, so this, in this particular example, we're way overbuilt because the short span, the steep pegs, our thrust is way down. Even if the pegs were by the edge, I'm not really concerned, but it's just a building principle that once you know it, you can try to optimize things to be as strong as, as strong as they can be without getting crazy on costs or labor. So the pegs are in the center, and another reason why it's in the center and not towards the end, when the perpendicular to grain is going to be your weakest point, is because of something, a concept known as hot dogs and relish. So relish is a timber framing term that refers to the wood behind the peg that would have to pull out for a joint to fail. So in this case, if our tenon looks like this here, and we have a peg and a peg, the relish is that wood is going to fail, and that's parallel to grain. This is the relish. If you want to picture the peg as the hot dog for a memory hook, be my guest. The relish is the wood that's going to fail, and typically having it centered makes sense. The parallel to grain is usually a lot stronger than the perpendicular to grain, but the tenon is usually a lot narrower than where the mortise or the main beam is. Because this here is say like two inches thick. And if your beam is six on the beam, well, you have double the wood that has perpendicular grain. And so it, it kind of balances out. So just the, the connectors in the center, and you'll see this on uh, industrial trusses that have uh, maybe built with glue lambs and metal plates. You'll notice that the bolts are either in the center or in a staggered pattern in the center. Okay, we're going to expand on. We're going to expand on the concept of the truss. We're going to move from the simple truss to a truss of webs. Now, this is really looks like a small truss, and it, but let's just say, for example, that we were thirty foot from here to here. Now, these webs, if, say, you know this is a 30-foot truss, if this, this span of, say, let's just say it's 24 feet right here, if this timber will, will reduce or resist any sagging, so the loads applied to it in that 24 feet, then this web doesn't have to be here. In that case, the webs would be cosmetic. 
But if it is going to sag and we do need support in the middle, well, then we have a web that is in compression. And this then compresses and it pulls down. It looks like king posts are holding things up, but really they could be a cable. So we have pressure down, right? And that downward pressure pulls on this. When it pulls on this, we get more force going down to the wall, and in which case gives us more force outward. In say like a 60 foot span truss with a two by four wall, two by four members, you'll see a truss that maybe looks something like this here with, with a lot of webs like so. And what's happening is this two by four can't make that span. So we get, we get forces pushing down, push it down and again, it's pulling. So that each one magnifies and it's a chain reaction. So we pull and we keep pulling down. And then so all this compiles, it comes, moves up to the ridge and then puts force down, which puts, puts a lot of force out, which means that joint at the bottom is really critical. And so you can see why I cringe a little bit when I unknowingly would sack, remove some of that joint connection in my early days framing. That's a good concept to know that what is that, that's that tension, the strength of how much that's going to withstand. And just for your information, a white oak peg, one and a quarter thick is equal to one half inch steel, mild steel bolt. And that is also calculated in its shear force. So it's, it's great stuff. The whole concept of a truss and the shear force of little connectors that can make big spans. That's that's how bridges work. That's how it's, it's all over in the building industry. So talking about lateral bracing and knee bracing, you can see here in this picture the same knee brace with force applied different ways. The members change in compression and tension. When we're talking about force from this direction here and keeping a building up, well, this, this knee brace is now in compression. The forces go, the forces go down, but that knee brace is like resisting. And you got compression on each of these joints. And then it's going to try to blow apart on this joint. Bam. And then it's in reverse on the other. In this, in this scenario, it comes from the wind or whatever comes from this this direction and this is just pulled tight and now we're trying to pull apart on these two joints so that's really in in timber frames this is really the probably the most common way to address lateral bracing and one question that we've had do we have any comments any oh just questions? a thank you from derek okay perfect yeah and if you got any any questions or whatever, send them in. We're monitoring that. We'll back up and address them. And whatever, whatever we got, we're, we're here to help you. Here to clarify this. So one, we had a question a while back about timber frames in earthquake zones. You know, what, how does that work? So one of the things that really help in a, with timber frame, and we see this a lot in old buildings, is if we've got a long, a long post with a knee brace, what's happening with this building here? As things move around, and as as it takes winds and loads and whatnot, or even an earthquake, this is going to remain rigid. It's fixed with triangles, and that's not moving. But we have flex in the post. And that flex can be our friend. It can be like a vine maple as opposed to an oak tree. A lot of times you'll see big trees just blow down in the wind if they're inflexible, if they don't have, if they get too big and too inflexible. 
And I've actually had a problem with that in my personal life. <laughs> so I know about it. So, so this, this can really be a friend in flexing with wind, earthquake, all of this. And just a little bit of an aside, just to give you an insight on how engineering towards earthquake, the, the philosophy behind it, is really about sound waves, vib vib vibration and the, the vibration waves. If vibrations line up with any organic piece of whatever it is, a, a structure, a car, it won't withstand if sound waves, the vibration waves match up. This will fall to pieces. It'll, it'll be gone. It's busted. Chevrolet had a car. I don't remember which model it was, but it would fall to pieces uh, going roughly 35 miles an hour over a bridge where federal reg regulations stated that expansion joints had to be at a certain distance. And when this, the, the frequency of this car, going 35 miles an hour and matching these expansion joints over a bridge, this car would start to just buck and leap and just start to fall to pieces. And they really tried to figure out, they spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is a mechanical failure and finally figured out it was just matching frequencies. And nothing can withstand that. And that's why you'll see sometimes in an earthquake zone, some newer buildings that crumble and crush and an old building built back in the day is sound as sound as could be, not anything wrong with it. And that's a question of frequency. The frequency of the earthquake was higher than that of the old building, but it matched the new building, and it crumbles. And so that methodology or the thinking behind all the hold downs and the shear netting and, and all the X bracing, everything with earthquake proofing is to do such a building so the frequency of the earthquake has to get pretty high before before anything before that frequency matches up therefore the building will stand down will stand up it looks like we've got a question we got a question from cole the earthquake in my area would move up and down not side to side like the coastline is that still applicable still applicable i believe so the one twist that call, thanks for the question. And restate the question. And the question is whether or not this type of lateral bracing will is applicable to an earthquake that moves up and down. And I'm going to see what, so here, let me just get rid of some stuff here. So Cole, if you, or is the, the Japanese, the Chinese, that ring of fire, the way their timber framing evolved, and they really have a lot more earthquakes than we experience, is really unique. It took me a long time to get my head around it. And it involves just a lot of friction. So what it looks like, well, for one, the uh, the Chinese temples and all, everything they do, they tilt their all their exterior posts in one degree. So one degree, so it's it's stacked to hold itself together. Okay, so that that's number one. What they also do is they have a real elaborate piece work. They call it not a real flattering name that the English have started to call. They call it a frog's crotch. Are, are. <laughs> I'm not kidding, that's what they call it. And all these pieces are interlocked and woven to a beam, and there's no pegs or anything. And so at first glance, it looks like there's just a bunch of ornamental pieces up here, and you know what's holding this from falling over when 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 there's loading problems on it, right? When it's and my mind struggled with this, struggled with this, struggled with it. And finally, it dawned on me that all of these pieces with friction, all kind of interlocking and they, they go 90 on each other, they create what you might call a flexible or adjustable knee brace. 
all if they interlock and they all stack together so they're all tight you're not going to shift real easy but then the earthquake comes along and it does this up and down thing you're talking about and when it's gone back it settles back in however it does and it's locked back together so kind of crazy crazy cool right i don't know that i'd have the patience to create that type of interlocking you know all that intricate thing maybe i should someday just put it on my bucket list but that's uh most and then for as far as our clients you gotta want to have the right look as well as the pocketbook to 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 fund that uh so good question thank you cole and uh, if you want to let me know if i've answered that well enough for you that would be good Okay, so here's a picture of knee braces, just like we talked about. Not, nothing new here, just a real life example. Okay, so we kind of covered the basics of tension loading and how it works in lateral, lateral bracing, just kind of as a concept. Now we're going to bring it down a little bit deeper and talk to you about the, all the different variations of using tension and compression to hold structures up, okay? Okay, so the knee brace system, we've kind of covered, this is just, this is really what's, I've got a very applicable question here okay. from, um, and Cole, by the way, said that works. Thank you. So thank you, Cole, for the question. John, I've worked with certain engineers that are convinced knee braces will not reduce the span of a tie beam. What is your take, Bert? Yes. John, thanks for the question. And Cole, nice to hear we got your question answered. So yes, that's, so looking at it from an engineer's perspective, Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit further. Okay, so if you if you've been to the Timberline Lodge, they filmed the movie The Shining. There, it's an old iconic structure, incredible energy. I love the place. Built in the 30s in the Depression, and it's just very robust. Steep pitch, a lot of snow. It's taken a lot of wind. Now that structure evaluated with today's engineering flunks it's going to fall over according to what can be quantified on paper all right so that the reason i tell that story is if you were an engineer and someone asked you to quantify how the tie beam span can be reduced by engineering it's a it's a lot of work and from an engineer's perspective why should they take on all this work to so work harder to accept more risk? That's kind of where an engineer is coming from. And I get it. You know, just take the path of least resistance, show the calculations that work, and then their risk is mitigated. They have to work less. And engineers, when they go through their schooling, of course, hear the preaching of, don't over engineer, don't over engineer, don't over engineer. But the only time the market gets that is when the costs get out of hand for the engineering. So things are going to go in that direction. So we're thinking about over engineer until the market says enough, you got to do something different. Too much rebar, too much this, too much that. And that's about the only thing that keeps engineering in check. And that I would be there too. I mean, it's, it's just a natural evolution until there's resistance. That's where it's going to be. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, John. It does, in my opinion, it does reduce the span. It, it puts more more thrust on posts. Okay, so here let me. So if you've got a tie beam or whatnot here. I'm just going to 
draw two different angles for your knee brace. And we've got a load here. We have had engineers just, and we have had engineers that have given us value for putting in knee braces. The knee braces typically will come at a real steep angle and sometimes even tie at concrete so that we're not dealing with thrust in the middle of the post like this right here. So thrust in the middle of the post then, and then, then we're also talking about blowing apart here. So from, from the engineer's perspective, if he's gonna validate what this knee brace does, he's got a lot of work to make sure this joint is gonna hold together for it, as well as the post, bending under load. So there's kind of a lot of, a lot of moving pieces and the best way to get an engineer to cut that down is to reduce the thrust just like this here with that steep roof like that steep roof in the truss analogy so i hope that helps uh, go ahead and uh, let me know if it's clear as mud or if you need more answers okay all right thank you for the question john um So a knee brace, knee brace system. Oops. What we're looking at again is just that triangle and then the post, if it's gonna strong, be strong enough to, to take all that load, but this is rigid. Just picture a welded piece of metal once the pegs are all in and that, if all that is strong, then it's not going to fall over, it might wiggle, which is actually kind of a good thing, but it's not going to follow us. So that's the essence of a knee brace. We've kind of covered that pretty well. Shear diaphragm. This is probably the method of choice for most engineers when they're talking about a timber entry and how to keep it from falling over. The, by far the easiest way to do it is to say that, okay, the body of the house or structure, commercial building, we've seen it in many applications. That is the body of the house. Just make sure the walls with all the plywood and the shearing in and all that have plenty of resistance and just use the roof diaphragm. The plywood going back with enough nailing and that's gonna create rigidity and therefore nothing is going to fall over here just kind of like your situation john engineer is not going to bother trying to do any calculations with that that's just like insurance from their perspective they're looking at okay how many nails do you put in the plywood roof diagram and how do we connect it to the main walls and if we've got that bingo we're golden we don't have to sweat it Easy money, easy calculations, nothing new, done. So that is the roof diagram. You'll see that applied in sometimes questionable situations where it's really going out quite a ways. And I'm like, yikes, that's quite a, quite a bit of leverage out there just to be pulling back on the house. But, but it works. And typically the first bullet out of an engineer's pistol. Okay, so here's an example of a small hammer beam truss, and it's comprised of a bunch of knee braces. And you'll see this style on a big scale with, with a lot of times some metal pieces. So metal coming across this big span opens up really big, but then there's this, this metal and it's, a lot of times wrought iron has some dextrous pieces to it. Well, what that means is the span and the loads were too great for the compression and tension of all these stacking triangles. And they had to create that, that cable that we talked about first and that simple truss to lock in those. And now you've got easy engineering, really strong truss. So what happens with when we get a load here, the load comes down and it basically comes through these knee braces down. It puts outward thrust here. 
and therefore it's trying to blow apart this. This right here is trying to separate. And when you, if you stack a really big span on there, the rule of thumb is to put this corner of your lowest knee brace as low as you possibly dare. And it's addressing this, all this thrust from the post and all that. And so it kind of goes back to the question, John, with the tie beam and collecting that load. The steeper this is, the less thrust we got out. And it, and it goes, the concept of the Roman arch is really with all those aqueducts and bricks, the arch being a real strong deal is, well, you know, the, the gravity is here when these pieces lock up and the gravity just goes through and that thrust goes to zero and it kind of fights each other there in the middle. And so it's really a, kind of your basic, once you kind of get in your head, it's easy to see. Okay, so load to footprint still uses tension. All right, I'm going to bring this up a bit here. So you'll notice on this, this here, this has kind of a unique entry. We did it, or Port, Port Cochere, we did it quite a few years ago. We've got all this, like, so we've got our knee brace here, right? got our knee braces here and a lot of them, a lot of metal straps and whatnot. But what's kind of funny is the engineer bases engineering right off of this. Those four, according to paperwork, and again, John, this is going back to quantifying what's going to do, what's the easiest for the engineer. And so this is really interesting. It's Basically, looking from the top, you take this, say that's a uh, the footprint of this, is, let's just call it an 8 by 10. Looking from the top there, 10 inches, 8 inches, and we've got a strap here, strap there, and then bolts going through, right? And they're offset. Well, what is applied here is how many bolts, how far away do they have to be in order to use leverage to resist leverage. So you're looking at this footprint right here, how many bolts have to be there and at what distance is to prevent that from lifting, tipping from one corner to the other. And if you can figure that out, it can't tip over it's just as long as that won't rip out. So it's uh it's another way to address lateral bracing. And we've used this in, in situations where people don't want the knee braces. It's really kind of ironic here. I would have thought that the knee braces would have been plenty, but that was what the engineer wanted. Path of least resistance. Through tenon. Okay. You'll see this in tables, furniture, and it's really it's like a knee brace, except that you've got basically a box beam that has, has the lateral braces built into it. And then this through tenon coming through. And we, and we, so we get connection here and here on that box beam. And now it's just a matter of how much of the post flex and you know, what kind of tension will those joints take here. And you see the pegs are right smack in the middle of the post again. That's one of the advantages of a through tenon, and you'll see that in many old timber frame, timber frame buildings, that through tenon, so when the post goes through, the relish is plenty of relish with that tenon going through, and then you're maximizing that perpendicular to grain tension resistance. Okay, so this looks like a hammer beam truss. It's not. And the reason is, is, is the thrust is coming down to a big concrete pier that then was engineered. So it comes down, it comes all the way through. And those, those piers were engineered to resist turnover. And that was 
what the engineer focused on was, was that turnover, how to keep that from blowing apart. And you'll see this concept in, you'll see this concept in A-frame, A-frame style homes where you, you maybe they'll even be concrete abutments outside the place. You know that, uh, and even bridges, you see bridges in a canyon where they'll just have these big concrete abutments. You throw an arch in and then you know, build off that arch to have the bridge. Well, that's, that's what it's all about. They just really make sure that there's enough resistance to keep that from blowing out. And this, this, these, these concrete things here are doing the exact same thing an engineer would do on a hundred foot span for a bridge, just with smaller numbers. How are we doing for comments, Lucas? We're all good. Doing good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about wood properties and how it applies to everything we just covered regarding tension and lateral bracing and holding things up. Okay, so spiral grain, I can explain that best with a toothpick. You have pitch cracks and wing stress and then knots in the wrong place. Okay, it looks like we're left where. So spiral grain, spiral grain occurs when, I'm just gonna draw a beam here. And this beam is free of heart. But if, if, if the spiral, if there's spiral grain involved, when you see checks and it's free of heart, timber won't check big, but if you see checks that kind of go and take off, kind of overlap. And this is spiral grain. And I believe the ratio 13 to one is what's acceptable. So in other words, one inch up, one inch up, 13 inches over. It might even be 26. I should, I should know that better. Our Sawyer's know it, but kind of been a while. Um, and in a, practical application, you may have ever, if you've ever had a toothpick that you've kind of been working with and all of a sudden it just snaps, you look at it and almost like creates a double toothpick with some long angles. That toothpick has spiral grain and therefore it snapped off and gave you two big pieces, right? Or two pieces with sharp edges. That's, that's something that is an inherent weak piece of wood that is a little bit tougher to spot, but if you know what you're looking for, it's something you know you don't want to don't want to have unless, of course, the piece is so oversized that it's not a problem. So with pitch cracks and wind stress, that happens. Here's I'll just show you this. If this is the butt end of a log, one thing with we're buying the really high quality logs, and when there's pitch cracks in there especially something like this, that means that any way you cut a beam out of here, probably gonna be hitting pitch and weird pieces in there. And that is, just really makes the, the, the wood, you know, leak pitch in the first place. And in the second place, it'll give you funny, funny strength, how, how, how it takes strength and, uh, and then re, re, reacts to loads. And then a knot in the wrong place, so if we're looking at the wrong place, not in the wrong place, there's a big knot that's by an edge. And if it's on the bottom, why on the bottom? Why is that important? If this beam was here and that knot is right here, this one is a happy face. This one, the sad face. Why? <clears throat> it has to do with tension and compression. There's a little clue. So let's start with a smiley face. The top of a beam has ten compression. When gravity goes, things get tighter. And therefore, that knot is really harder than the wood itself. So it's it's not going to be a problem. It'll retain its strength. But if it's on the bottom where there's tension, 
you know, like so, then that means that that would be the equivalent of having a saw cut there. It's just that knot doesn't bond with things and it's open up and that knot fall out. Well, so that's what wood graders look for. They look for a knot and how close to the edge they are. And a little bit like steel I-beams or eye joists or floor joists, you can take a you can take a, a joist and cut big holes in the center. And sometimes uh, you'll see this even in like parking garages, they'll do this as sometimes an architectural feature is like for looks, something that looks nice, and maybe even to reduce weight. So these big I beams with big holes out of the center. And that's not a problem because it's the compression on the top edge and the tension on the bottom edge that is giving it strength. And the same with knots in the wrong spot. So that's how that works. And one other word on, I said that how engineers address wood properties. And the way this works is whether the pretty big safety buffer is engineers first take, say, you, say you're grading a, a two by 10, how much weight it's gonna carry at 10 foot. So the way that happens is 100, 100 pieces of wood say are, are gathered up and they're all tested for loading. Where do they fail? The 10 foot span and it's all marked out. And then the weakest 5% are used for calculations. So the pretty big safety buffer there, and then on top of that, engineers have a times five, times five, whatever they come up with for their minimum, they have a times five safety buffer for what is allowable. And that's for any, any type of buildings that humans are going to occupy. For farm, it's different and whatnot. But so that's where there's a pretty big safety buffer built in. And my uncle's an engineer, and, and like he said, it's a good thing because things happen in life. So I'm not at all saying that it's way overkill in that. It's, it's, it's a good thing. We do have to keep it in check, and market forces are supposed to do just that. So there's a, another little tidbit to help you sleep better at night. And if we don't have any more comments, I don't know how we're doing. I think we're... Starting to wrap up here, unless I forgot something, Lucas. Uh -huh. How about you give a shout out to the new book and everything? And okay, sure. Where they can find us. And I do have some pictures here, some old pictures. Uh, I can share with you a little bit, but we do have a new book coming out. And it's a second edition of the book we've written already, The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. There's a chapter that it touches on this. We just covered. There's building tips, there's different styles for timber. And then there's also kind of like a strategy or really how to really make the best of your investment when you're gonna use timber and how they're gonna influence your space. Not overbuilt, not underbuilt, but that goalie locks just right. That's really what the essence of the book is about. So that's coming up and we can, if you wanna leave a chat, Say in the chat, we can get you the three chapters. The book is releasing in January, or we can get you a sneak preview to three chapters. And glad to send that to you. And of course, you know, share this, like this, all of the above. We're going to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. You could email Lucas at Aerotimber, L U C A S at Aerotimber.com to get those three chapters. Okay, the three chapters Lucas would prefer if you email him, that would be Lucas. Uh, let me start over. Lucas at aerotimber.com. Lucas at aerotimber.com. And there's one other picture that just occurred to me. I'm going to go through it. It was a unique project we did for Timberline Lodge. It's a current project. This is a long time ago. Here's a project that was just heavily robust, way overbuilt with logs and timbers. Lots of labor. Cool though. It's that reminiscent of the Timberline Lodge and the architecture back then for the parks. Well, 
And we do have one question here. Okay. You got one question? Oliver. Perfect. Oliver says, can you speak a little bit about using traditional framing on the outside of a house for insulation and plumbing and electrical and timber framing on the inside for aesthetics? Okay. Very good. So, forward one. So, read me that question again, Lucas. So, Oliver. Can you speak a little bit about using traditional framing on the outside of a house for insulation and plumbing and electrical and timber framing on the inside for aesthetics? Very good. So with this, what type of a, Oliver's question, as I understand it, is what kind of a conventional framing or construction for the exterior shell, keeping the elements out of the place, out of the home, and timber framing on the inside? And there's many different envelope systems to use, as well as people will typically decide if they want to use a full timber frame. So that would be something that has, where you see the, you see the whole thing, the whole frame standing, something like so. And then, with the exterior shell applied to it. So this would be the full timber framing. And hybrid, hybrid would be a lot of times you'll have maybe no posts with trusses that sit at various locations according to what works best for the flow of the home and space and, and all that. Either way, you're going to need some sort of envelope to keep the elements out. And so if we're talking about what type of envelopes to use, there's your conventional studs, studs and wall sheeting. You've got your, there's, there's the, the ICFs, the, the foam, the foam blocks with the concrete on the inside. We've done with block and where they insulate the inside with uh, there's the SIPS panels. The SIPS panels across section looks basically like a giant Oreo cookie. You have two sheets of plywood or OSB with foam on the inside. And for a full timber frame, the IC the, the SIPS have really worked well because they just screw to the to the whole panel and you don't have any type of thermal bridging between from the interior to the exterior whereas cross section of a of a stud wall this is here for the stud wall you've got your top plates and your bottom plates you go all the way through the wall we've got one more stud for clarity here and you get thermal bridging between each stud where it's going out because your R value is a roughly one R, an R value per inch. So a six inch stud has R value of six. One way to address that is to put a layer of insole board on the very outside before the siding starts going on. And that will, that will stop the thermal bridging and it's even though it's only a half inch, it really does a lot to stop that thermal bridging. And I'll just touch a little bit on the pros and cons. These are the two. There's the typical conventional stud wall framing for the envelope on the outside, as well as the SIPS. This is kind of the two most popular. The SIPS is gonna be a higher dollar investment. Uh, the stud walls work well if it's used with this spray and foam insulation really high value especially with the insole board and the spray and foam it's not going to be as good as the sips panel it's going to be close to where payoff over the long term you know it beats a really long payoff if you spend and we've we've you know 40 percent more for this over this one with the foam and the that's that's what we've experienced with our clients 
and now we're not builders generals, but this is what we've heard as, as they've done it. Um, the pros to the conventional with the foam is that any to your plumbing contractor, your electrical contractor, anyone coming behind is typically going to be well versed on getting their pipes and wires and everything through the you know connect even the cabinets there's the stud 16 oc or two foot oc whereas the sips can be new and if you were a plumber a contractor cabinet maker etc working with this system you're gonna be like hmm well okay better probably isn't going to go as fast i need to charge a little more and so there's that side of it along with the sips you do need to really think ahead for any sprinklers lighting that that has to be built into the into the cavity while it's while it's manufactured. So there's a lot of thinking ahead. And if you've had any experience with construction and all the logistics and moving parts and changing things, the more you have to think ahead, it's just it takes an extreme amount of thought, and the probability for error just skyrockets. So that just in time ordering and getting those short lead times really is the builder's friend and the owner's friend as well because they don't have to make decisions so far in the future. When they get out and on site, they may be sticking lights here, lights there. Maybe they want to shift this window. That is all plays to the strength of conventional building with the blow-in insulation. The SIPs do have a pretty long lead time. And if you have any jogs, a lot of different jogs in, in, in the structure, SIPs are really going to have a hard time. They're really going to struggle with that. And then the last thing that I myself, if I was making this decision, the last thing is kind of a kicker for me is if say I have this SIPs on a roof and there's the roofer makes a mistake, and there's some water infiltration and I get rot on one of these panels on, on the plywood. Well, that is kind of a big deal because a SIPS, when there was SIPS on the roof, it works like a intention and compression, just like we've talked about. The top layer is compression, the bottom layer is tension, and that SIP is where that strength is at. It's just kind of like I beam. I mean, that's right. So so if that half inch layer it's any sort of rod or weakens in any sort of way, it's a big deal. It's not a matter of replace some sheathing and get it waterproof better, move on. You're taking the ceiling down and you're opening the structure up to the elements and so on and so forth. So a little bit of the pros and cons there. So I don't know if that answers your question, Oliver, but great question. Thank you for that. And any guesses here as far as what type of system holds this? This is for the Timberline Lodge. This gazebo doesn't look like much, but it's 40 foot tall. It's got four posts and it's a six sided hexagon on top. Now, what's holding it up? And really, it is a glorified pull barn. If these post bases weren't here, these posts could just go down and pour into concrete. And what's happening is the, the steel pours down into the concrete and then these, these steel brackets are built in a hexagon. And our posts, we fit those posts into those steel brackets. And that is what's holding that up. And I had a few nights I don't know how many, but I was in the back of my head. I'm worried about this whole process as we're going up because I'm looking at this and I think, well, shoot, we've got, you know, 36 inches high or so of this big bracket. And they don't look like much here, but they were gargantuan things. They stood about six foot tall because you have these big wings that fins that went down into the concrete. And, but only roughly three foot poking up. And then this is whatever it is, 16 feet to the beam 16 foot of post and so if you're looking at a ratio of three foot and then you've got 16 foot above that so if if this has any slop you know things can't be perfect to get this post cut into this bracket and if that has any slop i didn't want this whole thing 
leaning like one way or the other because it could happen pretty easy with things just not set perfectly plumb and whatnot. And I got inspiration from post tensioning or pre tensioning. So what we did to avoid to hedge my bets that it wouldn't just lean sharply one way or the other is we tip each one of these a little bit like the Chinese thing. We tip each one of these in just a little bit so that once those posts were installed, we had to push the posts out a couple inches, just, just pre-tension that whole structure. And then it, with everything pushed, fighting each other, pushing that out and it just kind of pre-tensioned itself and was you know, right on. So that was, but that's, and that is all, that whole thing is as long as it can't break the wood or that metal base, this will not fall over. So we have one question from Steve. Have you built with or considered doing the exterior envelope with hemp blocks, which are tied to the interior frame? That's a new one for me, Steve, hemp blocks. Yeah, new building. New building. Style. Is it is it similar to, it's like hay bale, I've, I've kind of messed with that a little bit, but hemp blocks, what are the, I guess I really can't answer that. I'm not familiar with it, I, I don't know how big they are, how they hold up the water and mold and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. but, uh, sounds intriguing, I'll have to look into it. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so uh, yeah, great being with you guys. We do have a little bit of lag time. There's a buffer from when I say something to 30 seconds later, you might be hearing it. So mm -hmm. we'll hang out here for a bit, see if Steve's got a comment on Yeah, it. he said it's hemp shiv mixed with lime. Hemp shiv mixed with lime. Okay, and I've heard a little bit, bit, heard a little bit about it. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, I think we're pretty well wrapped up. And again, thanks for your time. I hope this helps you pursue toward your goal. And happiness is progress toward a worthy goal. And you have a worthy goal. That's so great. So thank you. Share it. Get your chapters. And have a great day. And Steve, we got the uh, link from you. Uh, Bert and I are going to take a look at that after the webinar. And I really appreciate your input right. there. And thanks to everyone. And uh, I'm going to just jump on board here. Yep. Um, so I'm Lucas. I've been uh, doing this with Bert, and we really appreciate you guys being on board. Lucas at aerotimber.com, L-U-C-A-S at aerotimber.com. Send over an email. So I've got your email, and I'll send three free chapters from Bert's mm -hmm. new book, which is available for pre-order on Amazon to search mm -hmm. the art of hybrid timber framing. And, you know, it's funny. I believe it was Oliver who asked about the mixture of timber framing with conventional styles, and that's mm -hmm. really what... Aero Timber really specializes in and, and uh, we're, what Bert does best. So um, Oliver, please send over your email. I'd love to get you some more information about that. Thank you guys so much. AeroTimber.com. AeroTimber.com. And if you're ever in the area, come by the shop. We'd love to meet you. Yep. Give you a little tour. Shake your hand. Very good. Bye-bye.